Hi guys, it's David here bringing... You know what? I don't need to say anything, do I? You've seen the jumper, you're hooked. Let's just get on with it. Roll the thing. Circle of life. Delicious. This is definitely humane. I, I can sleep well. I want them tested. The privilege to use laboratory animals. Ha! The jumper was a lie. See, this is exactly the kind of deception I'm talking about. This is what you need to be on your guard for, guys. Anyway, first off, sorry I haven't made a video in a while, but I've got some pretty good excuses. Uh, my laptop charger died. Then I was volunteering for the Vegan Society for a while. So, you know, you can't be mad at me for that. Uh, and then I had to abandon a video I was doing on hunting to address this, which I consider to be a much more important issue. Down to business. So today I'm not going to be my usual sarcastic, biting, wisecracking self because I'm not dealing with idiots in the animal agriculture advocacy business. No, I'm talking about a couple of fellow YouTubers, so I'm going to be nice. I don't plan on doing this regularly. I didn't even want to do it this time, if I'm honest. I ummed and ahed about it for so long that it's probably not even topical by the time this video comes out. But as a cartoon robot once said, I have shocking data relevant to this conversation. Uh, what I mean by that is, I studied the debate around GM crops in university just a few years ago, and in light of the recent videos and the recent content, I felt it was my duty to share my knowledge, such as it is, with the YouTube community. Also, my videos haven't had any dislikes yet, so at least this way that era is coming to an end on my terms. Kind of. As you've likely already gathered from what's probably a catchy title and beautiful thumbnail art, I'm talking about the debate between happy healthy vegan and a natural vegan over the issue of genetic modification of crops. So when you do what I do, which is basically looking at the persuasive efforts of powerful interest groups, you get a kind of sixth sense for deception, things like astroturfing and front groups. So when a natural vegan quoted a website called geneticliteracyproject.org, alarm bells started ringing. Yeah, I mean, how emotive is that? Genetic literacy, as in, if you're anti-GM, you're basically illiterate. You know, as far as the subject's concerned, you're uneducated. So uh, I did a little digging. It didn't take long to confirm my fears. Geneticliteracyproject.org is actually an industry front. Executive director of the Genetic Literacy Project, John Entine, is hardly an expert scientist. He has a philosophy degree, but that hasn't stopped him authoring, solely authoring, papers on the genetic debate, uh, like this one that he presented to an AEI conference in 2003. The AEI, or American Enterprise Institute for Public Policy Research, of which Entine is a fellow, is America's richest, largest, and most influential think tank, and has been referred to as the godfather of Washington neoconservative lobby groups. Not enough. Entine also runs a consultancy firm called ESG Media Metrics, which is fine in itself, except that one of their clients is Monsanto. Still not enough, Entine has also received funding from the American Council on Science and Health. Sounds innocuous enough until you learn, thanks to leaked emails, that the American Council on Science and Health elicited and received funding from biotech giant Syngenta in order to generate scientific reports on the safety of pesticides. Okay, let's go for one more. Sister organization to the Genetic Literacy Project is the Statistical Assessment Service, or STATS, an organization which styles itself as an independent non-profit, despite clear evidence that they receive massive industry funding, which is effectively hidden. Their IRS return reports between 2004 and 2008 showed their reported income dropping from over half a million to just $75,000 despite apparently expanding the scope of their work during this time. It has been posited that the majority of their funding is now funneled through George Mason University, the largest corporate backer of which is petrochemical giant ExxonMobil. More on the significance of that later. I'd just like to make one more point on the Genetic Literacy Project, and that is that the emotive rhetoric they use is not exclusive to them. There is one other industry which uses the exact same tactics. Can you guess what it is? That's right, the animal agriculture industry. Here we see the American Farm Bureau Foundation for Agriculture's Agricultural Literacy Project. Let's take a look around, shall we? 
Oh, there's a helpful video addressing consumer misconceptions about farming. Let's watch. Okay, so here we're told that due to the fact that only 2% of people in the modern world are actually farmers, and therefore the implication being that only 2% have intimate knowledge or authorities on the subject, that there's a disconnect which has grown between consumer ideas about and the realities of factory farming. Yeah, we know this is true. And they posit that because of this, consumers could be easily misled. Still true, but as will become clear later, what this actually suggesting is that it's the vegetarian and vegan communities which are misleading people due to this disconnect. Yes, organizations appeal to emotions, but not us, honest. Just ignore the happy music in the background and the overwhelming emotional need you're feeling right now not to have been misled by the other guys. That's not us doing that. We're going straight for the intellect, honest. Okay, let's move on to look at the pillars of deception. Can the world support more vegetarians? Well, the answer is more than just a simple calculation. You can't just calculate the answer, guys. That's cheating. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, basically their argument is that because some grazing land is unsuitable to be used as cropland, that you can't feed the world without utilizing that as grazing land which is nonsense because you don't need any grazing land. The crop land we have is more than enough to feed everyone in the world, if only that's what we used it for. Do cows cause global warming? No. Why? Because we're using data which is a decade out of date and, you know, we're not accounting for the fact that methane is several orders of magnitude more potent uh, greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. We're just looking at total greenhouse gas emissions and we're only looking at the direct emissions, not the indirect impact animal agriculture, whereas in reality that figure is nearer 51%. And look, they've got plenty of helpful info on GM too. What, you think they're lying about all the animal agriculture stuff, but actually they're probably telling the truth about all this GM stuff? No, they're using the same tactics. It's just easier for us as vegans to see through the animal ag stuff because that's where our knowledge base lies. But as I'll demonstrate, they're just as deceptive when it comes to their info on GM. Okay, let's look at this section on pesticide use. And straight away, you'll see that some serious deceptions going on. They claim that farmers using pesticides isn't as big a deal as you think, because us average Joes use more pesticides per acre domestically than do farmers in the agricultural industry. They even tell us that domestically, 67 million pounds of the stuff are used annually by these average Joes. Goodness, that sounds high. I mean, you see what the key term in that paragraph is, right? Per acre. So we've got two issues at work here. Firstly, and this one's unclear, are they talking about the active ingredient, which is the standard when the industry talks about how much is used? Or are they talking about the volume, you know, the weight of the product on the shelf? It's unclear, so we'll ignore that issue. But the larger issue is that even if you added up every pesticide sprayed lawn in the US, the area of land wouldn't nearly equate to the amount of land devoted to plant agriculture for commercial purposes. So if the 67 million pound figure of domestic pesticide use shocked you, you'd probably keel over to learn that the agriculture industry actually uses 5.7 billion pounds of pesticides each year. This section asks, do farmers use more pesticides and fertilizers with GM crops? No, honestly, insecticide use has plummeted. I mean, well, well, sure, I mean, glyphosate use has gone through the roof but it's so mild, guys. It's like the no more tears shampoo of herbicides. Huh, I guess I did end up talking about idiots in the animal agriculture advocacy category after all. Uh, what was my point though? This is a video on GM. Oh yeah, animal agriculture literacy, genetic literacy, two sides of the same coin, my friend. The industry are using the same tactics, you know, the same methods of deception for the same purpose, profit. Um, the same guys who are telling you that you know, beef is a good source of protein. <coughs> uh, 
and cholesterol. Are also the people telling you that GM crops reduce the use of insecticides, <laughs> but increase herbicide use. See what I mean? This is greenwashing, plain and simple. So at this juncture, I'd like to clarify that as far as I'm concerned, there's nothing inherently wrong with GM technology, just like there's nothing inherently wrong with gunpowder or nuclear fission, but it's all in how it's used. With that in mind, what I'm talking about today isn't going to be the much alluded to but never actualized potential of GM technology. I'm going to be talking about the reality of GM technology as it's used in the real world today. When you're asking yourself whether you should support a product or an industry which utilizes said technology, it doesn't make sense to talk about it in any other terms. I mean, would you say, I support the manufacture of fishing rods because this technology allows us to catch sick fish, care for them, and then release them back to the wild? I mean, yeah, that's a nice story, but that's not what fishing rods are used for in the real world now, is it? So what is the reality of GM crops? I mean, you may have heard of drought-resistant crops, higher-yield crops, and those make great headlines, and they do sure shift a hell of a lot of seeds and their, you know, associated pesticides. But what if I told you that they don't exist? That's industry spin. The GM variety you've probably heard touted as drought tolerant has only ever demonstrated a marginally statistically significant increase in yield during drought conditions, during industry tests. Did I say tests? I meant test. Singular, out of four that they did, one of them demonstrated a very slight increase in yield. The truth is that despite many attempts, to date, there are no commercially available GM plants with traits that reduce the effects of abiotic stress. Well, what about higher yield crops? We've all heard of those. Well, this is where it gets really interesting. You see the industry uses really, really clever semantics on this issue. You see, the industry has never actually claimed to be able to produce crops which have a higher yield of usable biomass. Impossible, you say. We've all seen the headlines. Yeah, headlines written by journalists who the industry was only too pleased to see get the facts slightly wrong. The industry has never demonstrated or claimed that these crops have higher yields. What their genetic modification entails was actually giving them smaller but more numerous kernels of corn per ear. So this is what the industry very generously terms as increased yield potential, not increased yield. So now that the fantasy is out of the way, let's ask ourselves what the reality of GM crop use is on the ground. This is a topic which actually would require several videos, a whole series to do justice to. Uh, so I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to outline one or two of the main problems. Okay, so firstly, it has led to the increased use of pesticides, i.e. herbicides and insecticides taken together which is a natural consequence of the fact that these technologies are developed almost exclusively by the manufacturers of these self-same chemical agents. Just take the case of Roundup Ready soybeans. I mean, as Purdue puts it, Monsanto are hardly going to develop, you know, doesn't need Roundup soybeans. It's just not in their interests. Now, you may be thinking, what about insecticides? These biotech firms, you know, they make insecticides too. Why then would they act against their own best interests and create, you know, insect-resistant plants? Well, first of all, no corporation would ever act against their own best interests. That's just not how they operate. So let's put that to bear right now. So instead, the question becomes, how is it in their interests to create these insect resistant crops? And the answer is now a matter of history, you know, a matter of public record. It's encourage the uptake of their GM technologies. They've got to have a selling point, you know. So yes, pesticide use and hence pesticide sales have dropped as a result of the developing of these GM technologies, but uh, that's more than offset by the sales of the seeds themselves, as well as the massive increase in the sales of the herbicides. A report published in 2012 found that between 1996, when these GM varieties were introduced, and 2011, insecticide use did drop by 56 million kilograms. Uh, I mean, which is great, right? But uh, during that time, herbicide use increased by 239 million kilograms, which is obviously a net increase on the amount of pesticide they're selling. So why has the uptake of GM technologies led to the increased use of herbicides? Well, it's because their overuse was enabled by the GM technologies themselves and encouraged by the biotech firms. 
This has created a situation where the farmers are ever more reliant on herbicides. And the reason for this is because the farmers are now stuck in a kind of arms race with glyphosate resistant superweeds. Weeds which have developed in response to the continuous application of glyphosate based herbicides like Roundup. But not only has this meant that farmers have to use ever greater amounts of herbicides, they also have to use more and more potent herbicides like 2,4-D and dicamba, which obviously pose a far greater risk to the environment and to public health. Beyond these issues, the use of glyphosate-based herbicides on the crops have led to a whole host of other problems. For example, they make the <laughs> crops more susceptible to attacks by parasitic fungi. They also damage the delicate microbial ecosystems in the soil, and they actually reduce the nutritional value of the crop because they make it less able to absorb and store important nutrients like iron. One of the other major problems caused by the introduction of GM is that it has led to a reduction in biodiversity. This concept is often misunderstood. I mean, intensive farming operations of all kinds damage natural biodiversity by the very nature of the fact that you have to clear away land to produce the farmland, like, you know, deforestation. But uh, what GM does is it reduces agricultural biodiversity, which is a very different beast. The loss of agricultural biodiversity is caused by the market dominance of one type of produce over all others because of the more profitable nature of growing this single type. In this way, over 90% of the fruit and vegetable varieties that were available in the year 1900 are actually lost today. This trend of the loss of agricultural biodiversity has been perpetuated and increased by the introduction of GM. Just take, for example, soybeans, the poster child of GM technology uh, in 1996 when they were introduced. They represented just a 2% share of the market. Fast forward to 2008 and now they account for 90% of the market share. And as you can see, this trend doesn't apply just to soybeans. The problem with this trend, especially as it pertains to food production, is the risk of catastrophic crop failure. For example, if you had 50 varieties of soybeans being grown in the country, widely grown, and one of them fails, then soybean prices would increase slightly. But if you have basically one variety of soybean being grown across the entire nation, and that fails, then that's where you get food scarcity issues. The industry is essentially putting all of their eggs in one massive basket. As I said, I can't really do an exhaustive list of all the problems with GM technologies, but there is one more issue I'd like to address because it's been brought to the forefront of this debate. According to Swayze, to be anti-GMO is to be anti-vegan. What does she base this assertion on? Well, she bases it on the fact that humans are animals too, and it's all well and good for us narcissistic Westerners to shun GMO foods. But what about the starving people of the world? You know, they need their higher yields. So first of all, by saying that this is a vegan issue by nature of the fact that humans are animals too, basically means everything literally is a vegan issue. You know, capital punishment, road traffic accidents, take your pick. But let's go with it for now and let's say, okay, GMOs are a vegan issue. So where, where does that leave us as vegans? Just one quick point, though the importance of which cannot be overstated, and that's that, as most vegans probably know, if you really are interested in feeding the world's hungry, then the best way to do that is to eliminate animal products from your diet to be vegan. So even if GM crops could provide higher yields, we don't actually need that. We just need to feed the yields we already have to the hungry people of the world rather than livestock. But let's address this issue directly. Swayze's assertion that reliance on heavily industrialized GM monocultures, you know, real world application, is the best way to feed the hungry people of the world is a view at odds with mainstream science. At odds with the part of mainstream science which isn't funded directly by the GM industry, that is. Because according to the World Bank, the World Health Organization and the United Nations, sorry, let's just pause and think about how authoritative the following statement actually is especially when compared to a crude industry front website. The export of the industrial model of agriculture and its associated GE-based technologies that are embedded in particularly exclusionary IP instruments such as patents to food poor countries shows little promise of addressing the needs of the hungry poor. Indeed, according to a recently published UN report, 
Far from heavily industrialized GM inclusive farming methods, it is small scale local organic agriculture, which is not only the best, but the only way to feed the world in the coming years. One of the major reasons this is the case is because of the food security problems caused by GM technologies. Remember the herbicide arms race that farms are stuck on, which we talked about earlier? Well, this is a cycle of ever increasing chemical use, which is wholly unsustainable. And this is because herbicides are derived from oil, oil which is a finite resource and the supply of which is anything but secure. No more oil, no more herbicides, and no more transportation from centralized farming operations. You can see from this graph how fluctuations in the price of food crops almost exactly correlate with the fluctuations in oil prices. So if you truly care about food security, feeding the world's hungry today and in the near future, then the last thing you should be doing is buying GM food, supporting the GM industry. If you're in a position to do so, it may be better to do as the UN suggests and support small scale, local, organic agriculture projects. But as most vegans probably already know, the benefits of doing so are dwarfed by the benefits of just simply adopting a vegan diet, eliminating animal products from one's diet. And this is where our focus as vegans should firmly remain. Okay, now that we've dealt with the issues, I'd like to briefly deal with the actors involved. Swayze, like the rest of us, is a fallible human. This particular fallible human chose a moniker for herself, that moniker being a natural vegan. And this has formed an important part of her identity. Therefore, it was only natural for her to look to side with GM lobbyists over the anti-GM crowd with their seeming preoccupation with what's natural. I'm essentially talking about confirmation bias and it's one of the hardest forms of bias to free oneself from. And this is partly because most people don't even realize they have this bias. But this is where you basically seek out and hence engage with a disproportionate amount of information that conforms to your preconceived ideas about a topic, or in this case, conforms to one's preconceived identity. It's not surprising then that under these circumstances, even someone who prides themselves on being rational could stumble onto an industry front website and use it to basically reinforce what were probably preconceived notions about GMOs. Anyway, now that that's all done with, it's time for a teaser announcement. Come the new year, I'll probably do one more video, a standalone project, and then I'm going to be starting a series on the big project that I teased in my very first video, but one that's, you know, taken me a few years on and off of research. And uh, so here's a quick sneak peek of some of the topics that are covered through this single case study of industry-funded deception. Some of the largest animal agriculture advocacy groups in the world misleading industry-funded science, buried findings damaging to the industry, accusations of journalistic malpractice, organizations promoting meat consumption despite registered charity status, the CIA, food leverage to influence geopolitics, and unfortunately, child abuse. And no, that is not hyperbole. So if that sounds like something you need to know more about, then I'll see you in the new year. But let's not dwell on this negativity now. You know, we'll deal with that in 2016. Let's enjoy the holidays. And have yourself a merry...